Hello and welcome to a lecture on Confucianism. Uh, hopefully this will not take too long and if so I'll be able to cover parts one and two in the same lecture, but if I end up going longer as I usually do, um, I might record the second part about Kongzi's disciples, Shunzi and Mengzi in a separate recording. So I want to start off with um, a brief history just so that we can understand what was going on in China at the time that these philosophical schools emerged, which will help us understand the shared goal that they had and to get a very accurate understanding and just to understand the, how the views evolved over time. We can go back um, a little bit prior to this time in uh, 2000 before the Common Era and we had um, what is known as the Xia Dynasty, which tended to worship emperors as if they were gods. So this was a time of we might say uh, polytheism, right? Um, but in a way that was very much personified by the leading figures in the world at that time. Then moving forward a couple of hundred years and um, almost a full thousand years into the Shang Dynasty, this um, god worship ended up transitioning into ancestral worship. So instead of worshiping emperors as embodied deities, the idea was that we can have a maybe more personal interaction with the spirit world through our ancestors. So um, those previous members of our family, once they have de become deceased, can provide a sort of gateway for us into the spirit world and maybe do things on our behalf. Um, and so many of the you know, rituals and ceremonies uh, from China that involve ancestral worship are very much still alive today and um, have since been sort of taken up in other Eastern traditions as including Buddhism and its later forms as well as Taoism. So we still see a lot of this uh, in practice today. But the most important period that we want to hear about is the one that comes after this, which is known as the Zhou Dynasty. And this was known by all of the philosophers as the Golden Age in China's history. So even though the Zhou dynasty was ruled under what we would call a feudal system, so very hierarchical, with a very limited number of figures at the top having power and privilege and the majority of individuals um, being in the bottom and sort of this labor class, if not um, a, for, a, a form of indentured servitude with the warrior class and nobility kind of making up the middle. This was seen as a time of great peace and prosperity in China's history. And so what we're going to see is that at the end of the Zhou Dynasty, there's going to be this um, great point and period of turmoil that a lot of people are going to try to sort of recapture a period from their past when they thought things were better. Um, we might be able to relate to this in our current environment, right? Um, politicians and leading figures trying to recapture some period from the past that they perceive as having been more idyllic, even though it might not have been the, um, the you know, seamless and wonderful existence for the majority of people as they envision it. And so the Zhou Dynasty uh, very famously ended for kind of a interesting reason. It's sort of a boy who cried wolf scenario. There was um, a young emperor, the final emperor of the Zhou Dynasty, who was trying to impress um, a woman. So often you will see in these stories, women sort of being blamed either directly or indirectly for the fall of, of great empires. There's a lot to unpack there, but the basic idea was um, that they would light these uh, torches, maybe like if, if you recall from the Lord of the Rings, you know, on the mountaintops to sort of send messages um, to let people know when uh, danger was coming. And so the young emperor was trying to impress this woman um, by showing that if they lit the pyres, then all of the surrounding villages would send, you know, their best warriors to come to his protection and aid. And of course, he did this one too many times when there were no uh, dangers and uh, nothing to f defend against. And so when they actually came under attack, of course, the idea goes that no one showed up. And so after the Zhou Dynasty fell, this created a sort of power vacuum which led to the most important period of China's history, the period which actually um, caused the emergence of the Eastern philosophical and religious traditions that we're going to be talking about. And that period is known as the Warring States period. 
So in China at this time, um, it was a much smaller region than, than it is today, but it was composed of what we call smaller state systems. And each of those states, because there was no larger empire to kind of, you know, give a maybe federalist as we would understand it, um, you know, consistent regulation, these states became uh, in conflict with one another, right? Trying to steal power, become the next empire, become the next capital. And because there, this chaos um, was such a big problem all over the country, a lot of philosophical schools emerged at this time really with the shared goal of trying to end the conflict. And so this period is sometimes also called the classical period or the 100 schools period in reference to the academic surge that emerged in response to the chaos. And so that is um, the period that we're going to be focusing on, right, the Warring States period, but also how the figures that emerged during that time, especially in the Confucian tradition, were really trying to recapture the previous Zhou dynasty, right? So at this time, there's a lot of chaos and warfare between states, so much so um, it was really described as something like maybe what we would understand as a civil war um, with, you know, neighbors fighting against neighbors, even family, family members fighting against one another. And again, there are a lot of similarities that we could draw between the kinds of problems in society that Confucianism and Taoism and other schools were trying to address that are still happening today, right? So these these philosophies, while, while they've always remained interesting, might be even more relevant given that the kind of societal strife that we're seeing in the United States and around the world are very, is very similar to the kinds of battles that they were facing, right? That deep polarization and split between members of the same nation, right? Different ideas of where the country should go moving forward, right? So a lot of this should seem uh, very similar to what we're dealing with and thus should be very relevant. So again, this Warring States period was not just a time of war more broadly, but also great injustice, right? So without, um, you know, a central empire to enforce laws, you can imagine that, you know, people really took things into their own hands. Um, you know, there was just, just very graphic descriptions of horrific, inhumane treatment of, again, family members, neighbors, right? Anyone that you could come in contact with. That created a lot of familial discord, and um, this was seen as really the result of scholarly neglect, right? A lack of education being at the central of their society, which in turn meant that people didn't have, you know, authority figures to look up to, so they were just acting on their own intuitions, and that resulted in things really going awry. And so again, the response to this is a resurgence of academia, right? And people saying, okay, we need to, you know, step in and we need to put, you know, our constructive thought out there so that we can help people envision what life should be like, right? And work towards that. And so here again, we have the 100 schools period. Most of these schools didn't, um, you know, achieve the sort of name recognition um, that we are maybe familiar with with Confucianism, but there are four very famous schools that did have a lasting impact and still have impacts today. And those, uh, again, there were many independent thinkers at this time. It was a time of great plurality and diversity, but the four general approaches, again, all shared the same goal. They wanted to overcome this polarization and try to achieve unity amongst their people for the goal of achieving peace, right? To end the injustice and the humanity and the pain and the suffering. Okay, so Confucianism is the tradition that we're going to be looking at this week. And it is probably the most prominent of any of the 100 schools that emerged during this time. And it's sort of founding um, principle about how to achieve unity and peace was through modeling behavior, specifically the idea that in a hierarchical system, most individuals, right, in the bottom classes of people are not going to have access to education, right? So if that's just a pragmatic fact of reality, then it's going to be a lot more effective to educate the leaders, right, the people at the top who have the most influence, and then the people below them will model their behavior after those figures, right? So sort of like 
just kind of embracing the fact that we look up to people who are in superior positions to us. And so if it's sort of like a trickle down theory of virtue, right? So if they act well, then those below them will act well. And the way to cultivate that behavior, both on the part of the educators and, and the public, is through ritual training. So ritualistic behavior here, taking a vast variety of different forms, but it's sort of like a, you know, practice makes perfect, right? If you engage in these rituals, even without knowing what they mean, over time you will come to internalize the lesson that they are meant to impart. And again, so you would copy those rituals either by watching those leaders or through perhaps even, you know, legal requirements or social norms. And then as you grow up, right, you will learn to appreciate the lesson that that ritual was meant to teach. Other important schools at this time that, again, had huge impact, uh, especially philosophically speaking, was uh, a school called Moism, which advocated for universal values. So something we're going to see in Confucianism is the idea that we should treat people differently depending on how close they are to us. Um, so, you know, de degreed or partial love. And the idea there was that, you know, if we learn how to treat people close to us very well, like our family, then it will make it easier for us to treat strangers the same way. Moism, on the other hand, is going to say like, that is the source of a lot of problems, right? Things like nepotism, as we can imagine, as well as other forms of just subjectivism in the ways that we typically don't value. And the idea was there, instead, we need to advocate for everyone treating everyone the same. Taoism, on the other hand, which is the tradition we're going to look at next week, is seen as sort of the opposite view of Confucianism. And so um, when we get to Taoism, we're going to talk a little bit more about the yin-yang symbol. But the idea here is that you can see Taoism and Confucianism as different halves of the yin-yang, right? So Confucianism being a more active way of achieving unity and peace through that education, right? You have to go out of your way to achieve that education or go out of your way to model your behavior. Whereas Taoism sees the structures of a society as actually the source of the problems in, in during this warring states period. And so Taoism is going to take the more passive approach and say that we need to get back in touch with our spontaneous intuitions and let nature take its course. And so we'll see more about that next week. One of the uh, final um, of these four general approaches that have been particularly impactful is legalism. So this is a view that we'll see came out of Confucianism and draws a direct connection between Confucianism and the modern Communist Party that we see in China today. And that is because Confucianism, uh, Confucianism um, had a long list of disciples, right, figures that sort of followed after the primary um, philosopher. And of course, as with any school of thought, it's going to evolve and change over time. And one of these disciples, um, you know, took this idea that, you know, we have to rely on a hierarchical structure sort of to its extreme and thought that human beings could not be trusted on their own to make the right decisions. And so not only do you need that hierarchy, but you need a system of rewards and punishments to incentivize good behavior within that hierarchy. And so this legalist structure, um, you know, was had a very harsh view of human nature, right? Thinking that it was not really good in and of itself at all. That legalist structure was a prevailing system for a long time in China's history and ended up being combined with um, uh, Mao Zedong's uh, sort of authoritarian, totalitarian regime later on. And those two views have merged into, again, what we see being practiced by the Communist Party in China today. So again, you can see through legalism, legalism you can see a direct connection between the existing political and philosophical views in China today with ancient Confucian philosophy. So now I want to introduce the founder of Confucianism. Um, so Confucianism began in China between the 6th and 5th century before the Common Era. And as I've already mentioned, has had a huge impact on Chinese politics, so much so that there are still very uh, generous and um, almost deifying uh, at, um, sort of portrayals of respect and admiration 
for the founder. So you'll notice that I haven't referred to the founder of Confucianism as Confucius. And the reason is that that is not his name. Um, it's actually a Latinized version of his name and is not anywhere close to what the classic cl Chinese characters um, would have sounded like when they were pronounced. So what's more accurate is Kung Fu Zi. Okay, so this translates to Master Kung. Okay, so Kung was his name. Fu Zi or Zi tends to be a designation of him as a master. So that Z-I or T-Z-U, again, it's going to be spelled differently depending on um, which version of the translation from Chinese characters into a Latinized uh, language you go with. There's um, Wade Giles and then there's uh, Pinyin. So those are just different systems of translating it into the alphabet that we're familiar with. And so I'm not going to be using Confucius because you'll notice that that, that name is missing the Z at the end of it and is actually thus considered disrespectful, right? Because then you're not recognizing him as a master. And so I will be using the more appropriate and respectful term throughout the course as Kung Zi. Okay, and you'll see this for other significant philosophical figures later on. They're always gonna have that Z at the end of it. And if they don't, right, that's probably gonna be considered a disrespectful pronunciation or spelling of their name. All right. So when it comes to, um, you know, measuring how widely practiced these traditions are as philosophies or religions, we're going to see a problem in that these traditions are not practiced in the same way that they are in the West. So in the West, you know, we have the Abrahamic traditions where you're Jewish, Muslim, Christian, right? But in the East, you can actually be many different things at once because they approach philosophy and religion almost as different puzzles making up the whole of human life, right? So the idea was that Confucianism focuses primarily on, you know, making society work better. And so you could be Confucian in your everyday behavior and your ritual practice. Or, and you could be Buddhist, say, for example, in the way you approach the afterlife, right? Because Buddhist um, Buddhism has a much heavier focus on metaphysics, right? The nature of reality, what happens in the, you know, uh, in processes of reincarnation and things like that. So you could have a, you know, a Confucian approach to daily life, Buddhist approach to the afterlife. Um, maybe you worship a few of the uh, more contemporary Taoist gods and then you have a Christian wedding, right? So the idea is that you can have, you can participate in all of these different religions all at the same time without there being any sort of conflict. So because of that, we're gonna see um, some, you know, wide gaps in the way that we're able to measure people's participation in these traditions, right? They're not gonna be as concrete figures as we get with other Western traditions. So we have anywhere from six to 10 million practitioners of Confucian, Confucianism in the world, which is almost 0.1% of the population. And again, that's mostly because people practice Confucianism without identifying as being Confucian, right? And this also goes into one of the issues or debates about whether or not Confucianism is a religion, right? But understanding from uh, Ninian Smart's perspective, which we covered at the beginning of the quarter, right? We are going to treat this as a religious tradition given all of the different dimensions that it, it is composed of, um, and the fact that it shares all of those facets uh, in a very similar way to other religious traditions. It just happens to be atheistic or non-theistic, right? Which we know is pretty um, common in a lot of Eastern traditions. Okay, so again, some other sources claim that there are over 350 million followers, right? So anywhere from 6 million to 350 million, again, very broad numbers because people don't always identify as such, even though they might practice it. Okay, and so when someone practices Confucianism, again, because that name comes from a Latinized version, that might not be the name that they're even very familiar with. And so they might call it something like Ru Jiao, which is the school of Ru, which is another name that is given to um, the teachings of Kung Zi. All right, so as I mentioned, 
right? Um, this uh, issue with language comes from the fact that the Chinese language has evolved in an ideogrammatic way. So um, these are strokes or uh, lines of the pen or writing utensil that come together to create they started off as almost pictures or drawings of the thing that they were meant to represent and have since evolved and become simplified over time. And so they're known as uh, characters. And so they're as simple, more simplified Chinese that one might learn today. We're going to be referencing a lot of the classical Chinese characters again, because like any language, this language has evolved over time, right? So when um, Chinese is spoken, it can take on uh, different uh, regional dialects, right? There's also entirely different versions of the Chinese language when they're spoken, the two primary ones being Mandarin and Cantonese. So I have a little image here just to give you a sense of how these characters might evolve over time. So you can see the Chinese character for a horse on the far left, and then it becomes simplified over time. And then at the end, it might not even look much like a horse anymore, but we can see how it, how it stemmed from that original image. All right, so a little bit about Kongzi's life. He was born in the state of Lu into um, great poverty. His father was a soldier, but his father died when Kongzi was still quite young. And so since his father was part of that middle class, um, his mother was able to sort of traverse the, the differences in class between their private life, right, being one of great poverty. You can see in the top right here the village in which uh, Kongzi was born, and the fact that Kongzi was able to have access to um, the types of resources that would have only been available to members of the nobility in the highest class, because through one of her, one of his father's friends, his mother was able to get a job working for a noble family. And so bringing Kongzi with her to her work, he was able to benefit from the education that the children of the noble family were receiving. Okay, and so um, he was kind of identified early on by this family as having a sort of natural talent for the various skills that they would teach. So this would include um, uh, calligraphy, right? So uh, writing classic Chinese characters, um, it would involve archery, music. Kung had a great affinity for music, not just in general life, but in part of becoming a better person. Horseback riding, right, or chariot uh, driving, other things like this. So there are a lot of different aspects of, you know, skill sets that were deemed as important in, in Chinese society. And he was able to develop those skills even though he didn't come from a very privileged family himself. And so because of this, he had a really unique perspective on what was going on in the world, right? So again, this is in the Warring States period. It's a great of, a time of great turmoil. And because he was able to both see how his family lived and how hard his mother worked, and to also see how the, the families of the wealthy noble classes lived, he was really motivated by what he saw as a great form of injustice, specifically revolving someone's socioeconomic status. And specifically, he noted two things, that the peasants, right, the majority of people, were burdened with most of the labor and also the heaviest taxes, right? So it, it cost more for them to live, even though they were working harder and making less money, if any money. And the ruling class, right, those who were the most well off had the most luxurious lifestyles, but also were able to not work at all, right? And so again, this might seem very familiar to the way our society is set up today. When you think about the people who make the most money currently in a capitalist system, you have to think about the stock market, right? So people who are not themselves engaging in manual labor, but their money is working for them, right? Or they're able to hire or outsource and pay someone else to, you know, do day trading and all these other little things. But even that is surely not as burdensome as hard physical manual labor, which most people have to do, and that, those jobs are going to be the ones that pay the least, right? So very similar, again, sort of disparity that he's seeing in the world. So uh, later on in Kongzi's life, he married, had a son and daughter. Um, unfortunately, not much is known or discussed about them, um, as is common in 
uh, historical figures, right? Not only does the history tend to be male dominated, but their significant others and children are not usually importantly mentioned unless they themselves have done something. And that's usually not the case, especially for the women of the family. But often the mothers will be a significant figure, right? So in this case, again, his mother was the source of his access to the noble family. And then after his mother's death, he himself became a teacher of wealthy young noblemen. Again, so the idea here being that if he's going to educate to try to make the world better, he's going to take a pragmatic approach and try to educate those who will become the future leaders, right? And so at this time, um, peasants, there was no social mobility, right, really, up from the lower cat classes. Um, he himself was a, a sort of rare exception in this case. And so the idea was that he himself had aspirations to become a leader, but because he wasn't bo born into the nobility, that was never going to happen for him. And so he thought that he would focus his efforts on the young noblemen who would later grow into those positions of power. So um, his first position, uh, official position after being a teacher, the closest he got to a government role was in service to the Duke of Lu at the time. Um, and so he was uh, the Duke's advisor. And again, we have a story of involving women that sort of created the, uh, the end of this part, part of his life. Um, he was giving advice to the Duke of Lu and the Duke was about to arrange some sort of agreement with um, a leader of another state and Kongzo was advising him against making this deal. And the other leader uh, sent over to the Duke, um, you know, like a, a harem of young women to sort of persuade him to go the other way, you know, to make the agreement. And the Duke went with the, you know, the accompaniment that he was gifted by this other leader. And so Kongza realized that um, he wasn't no longer going to waste his time talking to leaders who weren't going to listen to him like the Duke. And so instead, he decided to become a traveling scholar. So traveling around um, China at this time, sort of meeting with any figures who were willing, right? So kind of um, like a self-selection case, like he would wander about, his reputation preceded him, you know, as being a great, a great thinker. And so the idea was that um, leaders would invite him when they were, he when they heard he was in their neighborhood or around, would invite him over and seek his advice, right? So the idea was that if he bothered to talk to anyone, they were already sort of willing to listen to him and to take his advice. And on in this pursuit is where he began really gathering up more of a reputation and uh, a larger number of disciples, which would keep his philosophy going, right, for uh, centuries to come. So a little bit about um, Confucian metaphysics, right, their view of reality. Much like we discussed earlier in the sort of general distinctions of what make Eastern religions different from Western religions. So there's not much of an emphasis on the parts of reality that exist beyond the physical world, the everyday, you know, so every once in a while, Kongzo would make reference to heaven or spirits, but he doesn't say much of anything about them. And so most scholars think that he was maybe just, you know, using terminology or concepts that were accepted at the time, but that they weren't really important to his philosophy because he never expounds upon them or uses them to justify um, his views. The, the closest we get is the notion of heaven being, you know, sort of the justification for a hierarchy, right? So the person at the top of the hierarchy should be closest to heaven. And I, most scholars think that that's really just a way of talking about them having the best virtue, right? So we associate positive um, aspects and good character with heaven. And so a figure being at the top, being closest to heaven might just be a metaphor for the idea that our leaders should have the best moral character. And so um, I will urge you to reflect on that in comparison to our current political reality, right? Not just at the time, but throughout most of our history, right? Have we elected people who have had the best moral character, right? This was a concern that Kongza also shared, although of course at his time they weren't being elected, right? They were being born into these, these positions. So the idea here again is that 
even though some notion of spirit or heaven might be mentioned, happiness is meant to be found in the everyday world. We shouldn't be looking to an afterlife, right, or something beyond like a god or a deity or anything like this. We shouldn't be looking at that um, separately, right, or as being taking greater priority over what we can accomplish here in our everyday life. So the value of life is not dependent on some transcendent being, right? Our, our existence on earth as it is, right, is sort of the sole focus of his philosophy. And the idea is that we can't make that better without working towards making it better. And so we're gonna see this word come up a lot in Confucian philosophy, the idea of cultivating, almost in the way you would cultivate a field, right? So in order to make a plant grow, you need to put a lot of work and a lot of effort every day into t taking care and cultivating the soil, right? Cultivating um, the land so that the seed can grow and flourish and prosper, right? Uh, so that m metaphor is going to be used a lot here. And so one of the underlying, you know, points of this philosophically speaking is that aspect which is later going to be sort of expanded upon in legalism. The idea that becoming good, right, as a human being, developing a perfect moral character is not something that just occurs naturally, right? It's not just something you're born with. So according to Confucian philosophy, no one is born perfectly good. No one is born perfectly bad either, right? In the same way that a seed has the potential, right, to grow and flourish or to, you know, what do we call this, like a dud, you know, something that is not able to, to grow, so too does our moral character, right? It can go either way and it's not going to depend on the seed, but on the environment, right, in which it is planted that will determine whether or not it, you know, flourishes appropriately. And so according to Kongza, in order for a human to flourish, right, to cultivate a very good moral character, we require three things. Information, which he thought we could only get from a teacher. So this is information that you're not going to be able to access on your own. So none of, unfortunately, no like self uh, help in this case, right? You're going to need to find someone who has the knowledge, right? Um, they are going to teach you the rituals, provide the form, right, for you to practice in, in, in an external sense, doing the right thing. And that again, over time, those rituals will cause a reformation internally, right? So by engaging in these ritual practices, these external forms, you can create an internal transition or reformulation of your moral self into something better. So information, form, reformation, or in other words, having a teacher, providing rituals, and cultivating virtue. Those are the three things, according to Kongza, that we require in order to become good people. And so again, this reference to Tian Ming, or the Mandate of Heaven, really is just meant to refer uh, reference a natural ordering of the universe, which according to Kongza was hierarchical, and he thought that this hierarchy was necessary in order to make things happen, right? That um, having sort of everyone on the same playing field meant that there was no authority to defer to, and so decisions would not be able to be made in an effective manner, right? So he saw a hierarchy as a sort of necessary tool towards achieving um, you know, pr peace and prosperity in the world, right? But again, this hierarchy must be led by someone who is closest to heaven in a moral sense. So the people who lead us should be the most worthy of us, right? They should be the best of us, such that the rest of us can model our behavior after them. So what this means is that even though at the times, you know, being born into a position of nobility was really how you achieved power, Kungsa did not think that the nobility had an unconditional right to rule. Their ability to rule was conditioned upon them being worthy of their, you know, of their subordinates following their example. And so that meant that the people did have a right to rebel against leaders who fell short, right, who were not sufficiently worthy um, of that power, of that privilege, and who were not doing the best job in providing a positive example, right? So the people can rebel against any unjust rulers. 
All right, so here again, we have this sort of um, social structure on the right that depicts um, the common sort of feudal system in the Zhou dynasty that predated the Warring States period. And so the idea here was again that if people are going to aspire to positions of leadership, if they want to become emperor, Kongzi wanted to spread the idea that you should only pursue those positions if you have the right motivation, right? So you shouldn't be motivated to become emperor for, um, you know, less worthy reasons. You shouldn't be doing it for fame. You shouldn't be doing it for wealth. You shouldn't be doing it just to have power over others, right? These would have been very uh, vicious character traits, right? Signs that someone was unworthy of, of being followed. The only thing that should motivate an emperor, someone to lead, is their desire to bring harmony to the people, right? That's what should motivate people to enter into politics. Um, and again, it's, I think it's important to understand whether or not we agree with this in relationship to our conception of politics today. And so again, Kongs's goal was to revive the previous Western Zhou period. So this is a view called revivalistic traditionalism. He's trying to revive a tradition from the past, try to reinvigorate it, um, to bring about what he saw as something that was formerly useful. Um, but just to make sure that the pe in order to make that happen, we need rulers who are going to be making the best decisions, right, for the majority of people. So again, that Western Zhou period was known as the Golden Age of Social Harmony, and that is the time that Kongza is trying to recapture. And to do this, he's going to advocate for something in philosophy that is known as virtue ethics. And this is a theory of right and wrong that comes not just from Kongza in uh, the Chinese tradition, but we also see another version from ancient Greek philosophy from Aristotle. So two primary conceptions of virtue ethics um, that have some subtle differences, but both of them have some commonalities that we're gonna explore. The idea being that um, virtue is gonna be found in, in moderation, right? So not in any extremes one way or the other, and that cultivating virtue requires the appropriate environment that we are raised into and that the goal of being a virtuous person is to contribute to larger to the larger society in a positive fashion right so being a good citizen for both Kongza and Aristotle is going to be an important result of cultivating the right kind of virtues and so because this theory is focused on the person right and their motivations and their character really over an entire lifetime. This is known as an agent-based theory, right? So in thus in Confucian tradition, we're not judging actions, right? Individual actions is right or wrong. We're judging people and their moral character based on habits or virtues that they develop over time, right? So these are patterns of choices over a lifetime. And there's a lot to be said for um, why a uh, an agent-based theory like this is preferential, right? It does allow for some mistakes, right? So you're not gonna be judged uh, too harshly just because you mess up one time. The idea is that we need to be working towards progress, becoming better over time, not um, engaging in vicious, uh, vicious habits, but cultivating virtuous ones. And we'll see, again, exactly what the virtues are according to Kong's other different than Aristotle's conception of virtue, but they're all gonna be modeled on exemplary behavior, right? So you want to either imagine what a virtuous person would do in a certain situation, or in uh, Kongz's ideal social structure, you would be able to look to your leader and model your behavior after them. So the significant texts, the sacred texts in the Confucian tradition, primarily come from the five classics. This, these uh, themselves predate Kongza. So these were already well established by the time that he uh, came to prominence. So this uh, these contains the Book of Odes, the Book of Documents, the Book of Changes, the Book of Rites, and then the Book of Spring and Autumn Annals. The most important one of these classics, um, I think, to understanding the philosophy and religious traditions of Confucianism and Taoism, is the Book of Changes or the I Ching. This is where we get the designation of the yin yang 
and all of the forces within nature as they relate to these concepts. The I Ching is then broken down into a lot of other um, characters and patterns. So sometimes you will see um, the book of the I Ching, the book of changes in a text form, but other times it can be in the form of um, sticks. And those sticks will be gathered and sort of um, released onto a flat surface. And then the way that the sticks land, you know, as they crisscross over one another, is almost like a form of, um, you know, mystic mysticism in the sense that you can gather certain lessons or answers to questions by reading the way the sticks have landed over each other. So the Book of Changes includes a number of, um, you know, uh, different diagrams with different broken and uh, solid lines that represent certain things, right? So uh, it's a very interesting approach to the idea of a text, and I have a link there if you're interested in uh, seeing more about it. But the text that we get from Kongza himself, um, supposedly, is known as the Analects. Um, so this is believed to be by scholars, most likely <laughs> to be the words of Kongza. There is some dispute over whether or not Kongza was actually uh, the master that is quoted within the text. Um, and that's just because there were so, again, this was the period of a hundred schools. There were so many different philosophical figures you know, uh, traveling about China at this time, that there is the possibility that many different figures with similar ideas could have been attributed to Kongza, right? But the, most likely, um, you know, he, these were sayings that aligned with his philosophy. And the idea with the NLX is that the master, Kongza, is talking to various interlocutors. So these could be uh, Kongza's students, his disciples, right? So this would involve them asking certain questions, right? Getting certain clarification on rituals or concepts of virtue. Um, they could be the political leaders who sought advice from Kongza or who needed, um, you know, help in cultivating their own moral character. And it also includes, uh, quote unquote, strangers that they would maybe happen upon on the roads while they traveled around China. And these strangers typically represented opposing philosophical schools, right? So you might come across a stranger which would embody a Taoist perspective or a Moist perspective at the time. And they would engage in sort of uh, philosophical debates, right, um, out on the streets. And so, again, these are sort of like dialogues, but not really, right? They're not written in a necessarily straight dialogue form, but often something is either posed as a question or comment to the master, Kongza, to which he responds, or Kongza will propose a story or a question or anecdote, and then a conversation will ensue, right? So it's typically these, these types of interactions. And so um, the Analects are not organized in any, you know, analytic sort of fashion. They're not grouped together by theme or concept. Um, so I do have some, you know, suggestions in the week's content of where to find certain analect passages that have to do with certain concepts. I've sort of tried to group them to, together as best as I can. Um, and so just know that the, the part before the decimal point is the book number, and then the analect number, the specific saying, comes after it. Okay, so again, a lot of these passages involved clarifying ritual practice, uh, in some cases in, in very great detail. Um, so there's one passage that comes to mind where they're talking about a specific type of uh, goo, which is a vase used for um, a certain ritual practice. And you have to use the right kind of goo, meaning that it had to be made out of the right kind of material. Um, and this was not so much because the material of the vase, you know, intrinsically meant something, but that by making sure that your vase was made out of the right material, you were showing greater respect for the ritual and what it was meant to do. So things like that, right? Is it really important that it's made out of this, right? Sometimes little questions like this. Other times, you know, larger questions, you know, did this figure do the right thing? This other figure did something else, but they both seem right. Which one is more virtuous? So lots of different clarifications on ritual practice and questions about ethical norms. So now going into, again, this notion of human nature that is um, an important part of understanding not just Confucianism, but its later versions, especially in legalism. 
And this is the idea or the question of whether or not humans were inherently good. So as I mentioned earlier, it was believed by Kongza that humans could be could become good, but also could become bad, right, or vicious. And so what Kongza does mention a little bit about how humans might be seen as good, but the idea there is that they are not good full stop because even if we start off with a little bit of goodness, we still require the cultivation of that goodness. And so we're going to see this picked up primarily by Mengza um, in a, in, as one of his later disciples who kind of likens this to um, your morals being, again, like a plant, like a sprout. So we're not born with virtues, but we're born with what he, uh, Mengza called moral sprouts. And so that cultivation is to f help those sprouts flourish. Or, of course, if you're not in the right environment and you engage in vicious activities, you can kill those sprouts, right? And it would almost be as if they never existed in the first place. But because Kongza was not entirely clear about this conception of human nature, his other disciple, Shunza, is going to say that because goodness requires cultivation, that must mean that we start off as inherently bad or lacking virtue in some important way. So that's going to be an important difference that we see with his disciples later on. But the main thing that Kongza wanted from this was to give an account of moral education. And the idea was that not only do we require cultivation, but we learn best or we're able, <laughs> excuse me, we're able to learn best by example. And so what is the greatest need in society at the time of the Warring States period? Well, we're obviously missing those perfect virtuous exemplars in society were not able to look up to them otherwise we would behave we would be behaving better right so the idea is that if there's a failing going on in society it's a failure of leadership right that if society is in as great a conflict as it is it's because we're not able to look to our leaders and model our behavior accordingly and so there's a term that's going to capture the kind of person that Kongza thinks we should have in a position of leadership, and that is a Junza. Now, traditionally, Junza is going to be translated as an exemplary man, a superior man, a gentleman, or a noble leader. At this time, uh, leadership roles were only available to men. And so there's an unfortunate inherent um, gender bias in this concept. And so there is much debate about whether or not Kongza thought women could cultivate virtue. The basic answer is yes, but women had supposedly different virtues to cultivate than men. And so because of this, um, we're going to take on a more charitable conception of this idea and be more inclusive and define Junza as a superior person. Okay, so this is someone who has an unfaltering strength of character. So remember, if virtue ethics is a pattern of decision making over time, the idea is to get to a place where you no longer make mistakes, right? That doing the right thing is just habit. It's almost like, a, you know, an automatic response. It can't start off that way, right? None of us are, are inherently virtuous, but we cultivate it so much so that it becomes like muscle memory. We just do the right thing. And that is a result of having mastered the rituals that are being taught. Now, there is one position that is higher than a junza, higher than a superior person, and that is a sage or a master. And that was a, a title that was designated to Kongza, right, in the zi, as well as other significant figures that we'll see. So a sage is a junza who is able to maintain an unfaltering strength of character without any conscious effort, right? So they're so able to make those good decisions again that it, it's just done without even thinking. So this higher position, according to Kongza, is the state at which you're allowed to start commenting on tradition, right? So if you are working on cultivating you know, your virtuous behavior, if you've gotten to the point of a junza where you've just mastered it, but it still takes conscious effort, then you're not yet in a position to comment or make any changes to the tradition. It's only a sage or a master who can then be in a position to reflect on and perhaps improve upon the past. 
So what are some of the virtues um, that are emphasized by Kongza in his virtue ethics? Well, the first one is righteousness or yi, which means you have no biases for anyone except those who are right. There is li, ritual propriety. This is the practice of the rituals, which bring about, again, inner harmony as well as social harmony. So these rituals, you know, again, can dominate every aspect of one's daily life, even in the way you hand off one item to another person, right? There might be a certain ritual of how to go about that. And so the idea, again, is that by engaging in these rituals over and over and over again, it becomes a habit such that you don't have to actively think about it anymore. Then you can start reflecting on the inner peace that that ritual brings you, and then that will in turn serve to function to help society flow better. The next one is conscientiousness or zhong. This is loyalty and devotion to cultivating virtue, right? You can't just like do it every other day or do it once a month, right? You have to be conscientious and actively trying to, to engage in this all the time. Shu, which is sympathetic understanding. This is caring for others as you do about yourself. So this is a way of almost um, a word we would use today would be like empathy, right? So putting yourself in another person's shoes, right? Putting yourself in their position, trying to imagine their perspective. There's also very famously the negative golden rule. Many of you might be familiar with the uh, positive golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The negative golden rule actually predates that. We find it not only in Confucianism, but in other Eastern traditions, including Hinduism. And the idea here is do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. And so some people might see these as just inverse phrasing, right, of the same idea, but they actually do have different meanings, right? So it actually means something different to say that you would do something to someone else that you would want them to do to you versus not doing unto others as you would not have them do unto you. And the basic example of this, um, I think that's most easiest to comprehend is um, the idea of a sadomasochist, right? So imagine someone who enjoys receiving pain. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, everything that we find painful, they enjoy. It just means that they, when they consent to engaging in painful acts, right, that they derive pleasure from that. So let's say, for example, I'm a sadomasochist and I'm following the golden rule, right? So I should do unto others as I would want them to do unto me. Well, that can create a real problem, right? Because I am very likely to do something bad to someone else, especially if they are not sadomasochists, right? If they do not enjoy pain the way that I do, right? Then following the golden rule could lead to some unfortunate problems. So the idea with the negative golden rule is that even if I'm a sadomasochist, I should not do unto others as I would not have them do unto me. So even as a sadomasochist, right, I would want respect, I would want to engage in acts consensually, right, I would not want to be disrespected in these ways. So I can, that, in the idea is that that would be a better barometer of how to treat others than following the positive golden rule. And the basic idea here, again, is something about human nature that we have a lot more in common when it comes to things we don't like <laughs> than when it comes to the things we do like, right? So the idea is that your likes and preferences are not going to be as good of an indicator of how you should treat others as are the things that you dislike, right? That we as human beings share more of our dislikes in common than our likes. The next um, virtue is consanguineous affection. And so this is a fancy word <laughs> that hopefully we can break down. So sanguine here refers to like the color uh, red for blood. And so consanguineous is the idea of people that we share blood with. And so consanguineous affection, of course, is the idea that we should have greater affection for those that we share blood with or partial care for those in our family. And so this is that thing I mentioned earlier that can end up leading to um, some potential problems, uh, not least of which are nepotism, but also a potential conflict with righteousness, which was one of the first uh, virtues that we looked at, that you should only have a bias, right, for those who do right. This may be 
at odds with having a bias for a member of your family, especially if a member of your family is not in the right. Okay, so we can see how these can conflict with each other. But again, the basic idea here is sort of embodied by this uh, picture on the top right, that according to Kungzo, we just develop morally in a specific way. We start off at the center with our most basic self. Surrounding us are our family, then our community, then outwards our country, then the world, right? So that circle can keep expanding outwards. And the idea was eventually, yes, we want to treat everyone in the world, right, as we would ourselves. That's something like with sympathetic understanding. But that just doesn't happen automatically. This is one of Kung's biggest issues with Moism, right, where you treat, are supposed to treat everyone the same. So the idea was if you can't first learn to treat your family well, right, better than a stranger, then you're never going to be able to get to the point where you could treat a stranger like a member of your family. And so he just saw this as sort of a ripple effect that pragmatically speaking, we have to start off in those inner circles and learn to expand our, our sense of care and affection outwards, but that we should always prioritize those inner circles over the outer circles. So much so that there are even analects where he says that the virtuous thing to do would be to help a family member evade the law. So there is an analect where um, a young man has just realized that his father has killed someone and he realizes that his father was in the wrong, right? So he's not, you know, justifying the father's behavior or anything like this. But because of consanguineous affection, because we are supposed to give partial care for our family members, when law enforcement arrives to question the son about what happened, Kongza says that the virtuous thing to do is to lie to the officers and protect his father, right? That if he were to, you know, kind of tell the truth and allow his father to be arrested, that that would break down this ripple effect, right? He's not, in fact, treating his country on par with his family. He's somehow undercutting any obligation he should have to another human being. And so this would violate the entire sort of moral growth. So family for Kongza is going to be an important part of broader social stability. And the idea is if those two are ever in conflict with one another, we should always prioritize those who are closest to us first. And this leads into the next virtue known as filial, filial piety, which then creates um, an even further sort of hierarchy within the family, that you should have devotion to one's parents and one's elders over oneself. Sometimes so much though, so that again, you would sacrifice your own well-being for the sake of your family. And this, uh, again, unfortunately has especially harsh implications uh, in a gendered fashion. So women's obligations with respect to their family are going to require a lot more self-sacrifice than uh, men's obligations to their family. But all of these sort of fall secondary to what is seen as the master virtue in Confucianism. So this is seen as the most important virtue in the sense that all other virtues stem from this or help to lead to this. So in some senses, you can see this virtue as like the foundation of everything else, or you can see it the other way around, that all of the other virtues are important because they lead to this virtue. And I wanna to talk to you about it first in terms of the Chinese character, which we have down here on the left. Um, so, I'm sorry, on the right-hand side on the bottom. So on the right-hand side on the bottom, you can see that we have three characters, one for humanity, one for man, and one for two. So the Chinese character for Ren is embodied here by humanity. And the part on the left that's, um, uh, I'll use my arrow here. So this stroke here down is actually what happens when you combine the character for man or person with another character, it kind of becomes this, right? So this is the character for a person, and then this is the character for the number two, okay? So what that means is that this character of Ren, which we have here, here it's being defined as humanity, but Ren, what this character shows you is that this is something that can only exist between two or more people, which means that the master virtue, again, is not something that you can cultivate on your own. 
It's not even something that you can act in accordance with on your own. It is inherently about our relationships to other people, right? So again, reinforcing that social and communal aspect of Confucianism. And so because of this, Ren is going to have a lot of different um, translations. Its most common translation is goodness, but that again is a perhaps overly simplistic understanding because we might imagine ways in which someone could be good on their own. But again, in Confucianism, this notion of Ren or goodness is going to inherently involve actions with other people. And so we get different definitions from the Mandarin and the Cantonese. I'm gonna go through both. So in Mandarin, the closest translation would be humane love, right? So love is a relational concept, right? You can't just love on your own. There has to be something, a subject that you are loving and an object, I'm sorry, an object to love and a subject doing the loving. And so here again, the idea is that when you're engaging in Ren or humane love, you are extending benevolence or goodness and sympathetic understanding not just to other people, but to the common people. So that sort of grandiose understanding of humane and perhaps again, from the top down. So it almost in Mandarin involves someone at the top extending goodness and sympathetic understanding to those who are in lower positions in the hierarchy than them. The Cantonese involves more of the civilized person so focusing less on the love and more on the way in which you act. And so in this case, the Cantonese emphasizes more of those social interactions which are governed by ritual interaction. So the ability to return to the rituals and to follow the rituals on one's own accord, meaning that um, you are engaging in Ren when you are following the rituals for your own sake, right? You're not doing it because someone told you to, you're not doing it to impress anyone, right? You're doing it just because of a respect for and an understanding for what that uh, serves to function towards. But again, whichever understanding we're looking at, Mandarin, Cantonese, the general goodness, right? Which again is how it's most commonly translated. Whatever we're referring it to here, it taught it's in reference to the ideal relationship between at least two human beings, okay? And again, this, like any other virtue, is not something that happens in a single action. It refers to the content of your character over a lifetime, right? So you're doing the right things, right? You're engaging in that external form, right? Following the rituals, and you're doing it for the right reasons, but then the internal transformation right, that benevolence, that sympathetic understanding, doing it for your own accord, that is going to allow you to actually take joy in doing it, right? So if you are finding it difficult to do the right thing or to be good or to be kind towards others, then you might be on your way to cultivating Ren, but you're not there yet, right? Eventually you do need to learn how to take joy in doing the right thing. So how do we engage in cultivating virtue? Well, of course, first we start with practicing the rituals. Again, we need to do it by choice. So we can't, it doesn't count if someone's forcing you to do it, right? Sort of like when you're a kid brushing your teeth, right? Even though you're, you're getting the action done and you're benefiting your oral hygiene, right? You're not improving your moral character because someone's still forcing you to do it. And again, it's going to be better if you end up doing it for the right reasons, right? So not for any selfish reasons, not because you're trying to use it to gain some other questionable benefit, again, like fame, you know, uh, celebrity, wealth, power, anything like that. You're doing it for the right reason, namely you want to be a better person, right? You want to um, engage positively in the world. And then you're doing it with effort and intention. So there's that um, as aspect of practice, right? You can't just stumble into cultivating virtue. You have to actively do it for those reasons. And again, after we engage in that practice, the idea is that over time, we'll eventually be able to derive principles from those rituals, right? So basically learning the lesson, right? That the ritual is meant to impart. And again, we can only do this by deferring to moral authorities. So this is where we are constantly in need of someone who is superior to us to look up to, to help us cultivate ourselves. And so in this sense, 
um, Kongza names what are known as the five bonds. These again are very gendered, um, as is reflective of the time. But the idea here was that there are five bonds that one can look to if you're not sure who to defer to in a certain situation. So those um, over here on the left are going to be the individuals in authority figures, and these are all going to be um, in or positions that are held by men. In the right-hand side, these are all going to be the quote-unquote subordinate positions, those who you have to def um, who must do the deferring, right? In either case, this is the only place where you will find women, only specifically mentioned here. So there is the parent-child relationship. As it is originally explained, it's the father-son relationship, and it is considered to be the most important of the five bonds. There is the elderly-younger relationship, which we again see in filial piety. There's the ruler-subject relationship, right, which embodies the greater social hierarchy. There is the husband-wife or man-woman relationship. And then there is the older friend, younger friend relationship. Now, what is important is that with each of these bonds, the individuals on the right are supposed to defer to those on the left for what to do, what the right thing to do is. But it is seen as a somewhat reciprocal relationship. You can see the arrows go both ways because these individuals on the left also have an obligation, right? So if these people are coming to them for guidance, they have certain obligations to help them better themselves and also often to provide for them in certain ways. And you can see here the types of care and protection, right, service that they're meant to provide. And so there is a sort of ideal codependence here, although clearly they favor this side more so than this side. So again, each is seen as having an obligation to the other. Now, what if you disagree, right? What if you are someone here on the right and you think that the person on the left who you're supposed to be deferring to gets something wrong, right? You ask for their advice and they tell you something that you just strongly disagree with, you think they're mistaken or, you know, any number of reasons. Well, Kongza does have one possible way for you to deal with this sort of conflict. And the word that he uses for that is remonstration. So to remonstrate is when the person in the inferior position here is trying to persuade the person in the superior position to change their mind. And according to Kungza, right, you only have one chance to do this, and it must be done in the most respectful way possible. And you are meant to attempt to remonstrate with them using reason. And the idea is that if you are here and you are arguing, right, or debating or trying to persuade right, the superior person, if you can't do it, let's say you're a child and you're trying to persuade your parent to change their mind about something, if you're unable to change their mind, the presumption then is that your reasoning wasn't good enough. And if it was, you would have been able to change their mind. So even though you get a chance to argue with someone in a superior position, the larger hierarchy at stake is always going to be more important. And so you get one chance, if it doesn't work, then you must do what the superior person said. All right, so that's your one chance to, uh, to sort of insert yourself, but the idea is that if you fail, it's probably because your position wasn't the right one, and so you should defer to the authority figure. And the idea is that over time, through practicing these rituals, engaging in this, you know, educational relationship with someone in a higher position of authority than you, you will develop habits over time, which eventually should become firm and unchanging, right? Again, to become a Junza, we want that moral, char moral character to not make any faults, to not make any mistakes. And then eventually, if you are able to become a sage, that it will happen without any conscious effort. So one of the other issues in um, the Analects is that there is some potential worries in the way that Kongza defines virtue. It's pretty easy to note that not only are there a number of different definitions that are given, but that what counts as virtuous for one person in one situation ends up not being considered virtuous for another person 
in another situation or even in the same situation. And so this leads to an interesting approach to understanding Confucian virtue ethics, which is the idea that each answer that Kongzi gives is not meant to capture the whole thing. It's meant to be tailored to the specific student or disciple that he's talking to. And the idea was that when you're learning something, everyone begins with different starting points. So if we were to imagine a square, right, and the point is to, uh, you know, get all four corners of the square to understand what that concept is, well, one person might be starting off with one corner, so they might need to learn about the opposite corner, whereas the other person might be starting off with that bit of knowledge and so needs to learn about something else, right? So the idea is that not only does truth take time, but it's learned in parts and can mean different things to different people. So I think the best example of this is to think about, you know, being in the classroom. You know, part of, I think, what a lot of teachers try to impart to students is, you know, what the appropriate learning environment is and can be like. And a lot of those dynamics between the authority figure, the teacher, and the students in the classroom, I think we internalize that over time and, you know, take it out with us into the world. So let's say, you know, class discussion is being utilized as a tool to impart some of these skills. Well, you might notice that the instructor goes out of their way to include people who don't volunteer to participate in, in the conversation, right? Those students who, who never raise their hands, who are very quiet, right? The teacher might spend more time trying to coax conversation out of them, whereas someone else who is always eager to raise their hand, who has lots to say, might oftentimes you know, be overlooked or be asked, you know, to kind of hold off on and allow space for another student to talk, right? The idea is that they're all trying to learn the same thing, but because the students are beginning in different starting points, they need different lessons, right? So being a good student means the same thing to all the students, right, and to the teacher, but the teacher needs to encourage that in one student differently than they do in someone else, right? So this is the same idea that virtue, everyone's coming with different starting points and they're very complex. And so we're gonna learn in different ways at different times. So because of this, you can almost approach the Analects as if Kungs is not really giving any definitions at all. Instead, again, he's just giving a certain piece of the puzzle to someone in the context of what they need to learn and what their strengths are or what areas they need for improvement, right? So often if we were to look at just a single analect at a time, that's not gonna be a sufficient way of understanding what Kongza means by discussing this particular concept. And also there's a pragmatic problem, right? If Kongza were to give just a you know, one line definition for what it meant to be good, well, he's very aware that we can often undermine those concepts or definitions with, you know, an analysis. Just, you know, oh, well, if that's what you mean by goodness, well, then here's a counterexample over here. And so Kongzu wanted to avoid that by saying, yes, goodness is going to look different in all kinds of situations. And so because of that, virtue ethics is very contextual, right? What it means to be virtuous in a certain situation is not just going to be determined by the situation, but also which parties are involved, right? And what their strengths are at the time, what their weaknesses are at the time, right? So because of this, we can, if we're being charitable, Kongza is giving us a partial picture of these concepts rather than a complete one, right? So again, we wanna think of it maybe like a square where you give one corner to one student and the students then need to work on the other pieces depending on where their needs are. So if that is the difficulty that we encounter in defining virtue, we can imagine that it might be even more difficult to identify it in the real world. And this again is where we see a similarity between Confucian virtue ethics and Aristotelian virtue ethics. This comes from the doctrine of the mean. And by mean here, we don't mean being mean to someone, right? We mean mean like average, okay? So if maybe in math, you're familiar with mean, median, and mode, right? So mean here, we're talking about the middle. So this is the idea that virtue is always going to be in moderation, in between two extremes, right? So this is how we're meant to be able to identify virtue in a specific context, right? The question is, right, 
Is it insufficient, right? Could we add a little bit more to it to make it better? Or is it too excessive? Do we need to remove a little bit to make it better? So the idea is that you're able to identify virtue when you can't add to or take away from it without taking away the goodness of it, okay? And so this in and of itself is contextual, but it is universal in the sense that whatever the virtuous thing to do is in that situation is going to be true full stop. It's not that, you know, it's okay for me to lie to my students in one situation, but it's not okay for me to lie to them in another, right? Whether or not it's gonna be okay for me to lie, it's gonna depend upon my position, the student's position, right, and the context at the time, but it's not that another teacher in my position would, it would be okay for them to lie, right? So because this is so complex, again, it's going to utilize a lot of acquired moral tools, right, again, so understanding the rituals, being able to defer to authority, being able to understand the complexity of these concepts, but Kongza did think that we could measure it through social interactions, right? Because the goal is, again, for us to bring about peace and unity in society. So oftentimes that virtue, that, that thing in between two extremes will help um, kind of go towards that end. And so again, it is subjective to individuals, right? So what's right to me, uh, what's right for me in the classroom as the teacher is gonna be different from what it's right for the student to do in the classroom, right? So subjective to our positions, but universal in that any teacher in my position, right, should do a, a certain way, and that any student in the classroom should do it a certain way. Okay, so because of this, all of the situations that we encounter in our lives are bound to be different, right? If the context always matters, then what is gonna be the right thing to do will always differ. So because of this, learning to cultivate our virtue is a never a fully completed process. We're never finished with it. And this can kind of unveil a lot of different philosophical problems, right? How exactly are we to figure out what a virtuous person would do in this situation? Is there even such a thing as a virtuous p person, right? If it's something that it takes our entire life to cultivate, maybe no one's ever fully virtuous. There are a lot of different, different epistemological concerns that can arise from this. But again, we might, be partial to the fact that this type of ethic, again, allows for some gray area, right? It allows for that wiggle room trying to move your way towards the center, towards the mean, without getting overly penalized for falling short, right? So here are some examples about uh, some of the questions that can arise become of, uh, because of this. Okay, so I'll let you take a look at those.